most original and creative talent in our business. Would you welcome Mr. Orson Welles? Ladies and gentlemen, Orson Welles again, come to call for another visit. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Stay tuned. Right after this episode. For our discussion. Hello, this is Orson Welles, and this is 15 minutes of personal opinion, mine and yours too. We give you a radio, a five-tube table model made by Lear for any letter we can use. We'll get to that in just a minute. Nowadays, turning out a radio is far more than assembling a number of parts. To give you what you expect in fine performance requires sound fundamental design, skilled craftsmanship, and familiarity with the newest in radio science. And this is just why you are going to appreciate Lear radios so well. Lear has been building the most exacting type of radios since 1930. They have been aircraft radios, radios that had to be up to the minute in every scientific detail. For 16 years, working like this becomes a habit, so you can expect the same high type of design and workmanship in the Lear radio you can buy for your home. As to the new developments, you may already know about the Lear tape recorder, a new kind of recording that is many steps ahead even of wire recording. Later on, I'll tell you more about it. Meanwhile, just remember, you can expect the finest and the most for your money in a radio that has the nameplate Lear, L-E-A-R. Now, back to Orson Welles. My apartment was really too cold late last night to work in. Dear landlady, in case you're listening, it's a very nice apartment, no matter what its temperature, and I know how lucky I am to live in it. However, it was chilly, and since my blood is thin by the tropics of Hollywood, I took pencil and paper and went forth to write this broadcast in that climate my poor old battered muse seems to require. I found that climate where I've so often found it before, in Rubens, a sandwich shop on 58th Street. Did I say sandwich shop? Rubens is far more than that. The menu reads like the program of a playhouse, and the proprietor, Mr. Arnold Rubin, that Ziegfeld of the delicatessen, stars his sandwiches in no uncertain typeface. There is, for example, the Carol Bruce sandwich, number 22, consisting of tongue, mustard, and melted Swiss cheese on toasted rye. There's a sandwich named after Sophie Tucker. There's the Colonel J.C. Flippin sandwich and the Tyrone Power. I am personally prejudiced in favor of the Leonard Lyons, turkey, Bermuda, onion, hard-boiled egg, and I can't resist mentioning the Orson Wells, a giveaway at a dollar ten. Turkey, India relish, and lettuce. I must say I call it very tactful on Mr. Rubin's part to leave out of my sandwich any mention of ham. Now, this was by no mean manner of means the first time I've composed a radio show at Rubin's. The place used to be less crowded before the boom, and about that time of the morning when words finally come to my pencil point, I used to sit at the last table on the left and write the letter away with nothing between me and solitude but the occasional sports lover, the casual comedian, the intermittent chorus girl. Writing this show at my old table brought back so many shows I've written there, and I'd like to say that it's always been fun writing them for you and writing them at Rubin's. But my nights aren't always sleepy just because it's cold. I'm living in New York these days and where I've always wanted to live by the river. The East River, I mean. Morning sun is mirrored on the water and projected again in a wonderful silvery shimmer on the ceiling over my bed. And all night the air is full of the sound of shipping. River sounds, bells and buoys and the sweet mournful complaint of steam whistles echoing cozily all the way from the sea reaches to my front door. I've been hoping for such a place as I have now since the first day I came as a resident of Manhattan, or the second day to be exact, when I walked into Alec Wolcott's apartment and found him across a backgammon board from Dotty Parker. There was a good-humored little fire chuckling in the grate. Mr. Toscanini was entertaining on the gramophone, and through the window behind the backgammon game, I could see a whole ballet of tugboats. This is for me, I said to myself. I was sleeping at the time on a bed which tilted up and turned into a bathtub in the back room of a basement in the early 80s, and this cost me $6.50 a week. Since then, as they say, my standards have changed, which simply means that I've produced enough plays and movies to worry about the income tax. But frankly, my apartment by the river isn't nearly so grand a place as Alec Wolcott's was. But it's no basement. There's no bathtub under my bed, and the river view is exactly according to the specifications of my fondest dreams. Well, I sat by the window last night before I went to Rubens and watched the boats go by and thought about these things, about basement apartments and river apartments. And I'd like to make public confession of the fact that my thoughts left me with a hangover. Right under my window, a boat puts off every 20 minutes or so on a voyage. 
Every time it slips its hawser, my heart skips a beat and something inside me slips a hawser of its own. This is that corny thing, the wanderlust, kicking up its old corny stir. The restlessness of the tramp that sent me tramping off in so many directions and on so many far-flung missions and adventures and fool's errands. But the boat under my window doesn't go very far, just across the river. Then it comes back. Across the river is an island, and it's no Tahiti. It's a place of public hospitals and prisons. They call it Welfare Island. Certainly the boat looks better to the poor wretches watching it across the river from me through the bars. I can almost see the unlucky faces on that island. Straining, straining, looking at me. Because that is a place where people are in jail. I can actually feel a hard stare upon me, and it frankly spoils my fun. There are so many eyes upon us who have peace and plenty, and only a few are the eyes of the misfits we keep in jails. There are the hungry eyes, millions upon millions in Europe and Asia and the slave colonies of our own hemisphere, and it isn't easy to avoid that huge and questioning stare. It's like being in a police lineup. We can't see our accusers, but we hear their breathing in the darkness. I think it's hard to eat three meals a day today without a bit of indigestion. When I first went to call on Alec Walcott, the world was still a little young and gay around the edges. The war that isn't over yet was brewing then in Spain and China, but it did look for a minute there as though a man could write plays and put them on and enjoy what are called the fruits of success. Even Alec, who was one of the high priests of our American success myth, changed his mind about that at the end, and nobody I know who's worth his weight in fool's cap or grease paint sleeps very well these nights. Me, I've made the East River at last, but I share the general insomnia. Seems there's something called an atom bomb. Seems there's a great fuse wound around the world, and the fuse is lit, and the sound of it sputtering is very loud, and a man or a woman can't sleep for the sound of it. Not without drugs. Before it's too late, we've got to do something. Well, this weekly broadcast of mine is simply one of the feeblest of the attempts. Am I bringing issues to this microphone? Am I helping to clarify those issues? Am I helping at all? I want you to help me to help. That's why I ask for letters. I need your advice, as well as your viewpoint. I've been very frank with you. Now you'll be frank with me. Well... While the partisans of democracy are dying in Argentina's concentration camps, Nazi agents, among them Ricardo Stout, Ludwig Freud, Fritz Mandel, enjoy the personal protection of the dictator Perón. Government contracts are going to Nazi businessmen and Nazi scientists are working feverishly on the atom bomb. Says dictator Perón, war is an inevitable social phenomenon. Says your obedient servant. Well, excuse me, word deleted by censor. Instead of nominating one of these gangsters to the court of justice, as we've been suggesting, a police force under the Security Council should depose Perón forthwith and give the Argentine people a chance to set up their own democracy. I don't happen to think they'll get that chance at the voting booths today. Spruill Braden, democracy's best diplomat, has done everything he could to make up for the mistakes Ed Statinius and Nelson Rockefeller made in the conferences in Mexico and San Francisco. Maybe he comes too late, but I'm a natural-born optimist, and I say he comes just in the nick of time. There's another conference this spring, a meeting of the American republics in Rio. Braden's blue book may keep Argentina out of that meeting if Argentina's Nazis are still barricaded in the government buildings of VA. Today, you know our hemisphere Hitler, Colonel Juan Domingo Perón, is pretending to submit to the ballot box. The colonel's mob will supervise all voting, and nobody knows how it'll come out, but everybody's sure that no matter what happens, the colonel won't quit. He's a rabble-rouser, and he has a following. If he can manipulate that following so it looks like a majority, Perón is president. But if it turns out that the average Argentina, who's a good Democrat, can't be hushed up any longer, it's a lead-pipe cinch that the sawdust Caesar of the Pampas won't go peaceably back to Patagonia. He'll stay in power the same way he got here, the gangster way. And the choice in Argentina on this election day is a Perón landslide or a shooting war. And Perón has all the guns. His backers, who were Hitler's backers, make the bullets. They have $7 billion swag hidden away down there in Perón's territory, war profits. And if need be, they'll finance another war to keep it. There's only one real question. If it comes to a showdown, can the colonel deliver the army? Most of the officers of that army come from Argentina's first families. 
The Estancieros, the big landowners. And Perón says he's going to break up those huge estates, and he probably means it. The landowners are sure he does, and they've been fighting Perón in this election campaign. But these same landowners, don't forget, made Perón possible. The government he overthrew was their government, a reactionary, do-nothing administration under which the muscles of Argentina's democracy had grown flabby. There's a lesson in that. Using Mussolini and Franco and Hitler's examples, historians have been claiming that a fascist revolution can only succeed in an atmosphere of social unrest. But Perón's fascism succeeded in an atmosphere of social cynicism. How well I remember Argentina in that mood of rueful despair. It darkened the streets of Buenos Aires, a kind of spiritual dim-out. There was music and dancing. There were theaters and cabarets and big parties. There was the racetrack and the jockey club and beautiful women and beautiful dresses and beautiful homes. But... Those of us who visited or lived there in those years found it all very sad, very ominous. Remember, please, the common man of Argentina, the good Catholic common man, was against Franco in the Civil War of Spain. Then why did he sit still for Perón in his own country? Argentina's common man was against Hitler. Then why didn't he fight Hitler? Well, he was weakened by a disease called isolationism and never treated for it by a shock cure like Pearl Harbor. The common man was softened up for tyranny by life under a government he had no part in. A government by a selfish few that would have no part of him. Why don't you do something about it? I asked so many Argentinians, and so many of them answered, what can you do? What's the use? Then one dark night, the colonel's gang took over, and the moral is you don't need to starve a people to make them slaves. You can take their freedom away from them if you take away their belief in themselves. You don't need bread lines to make a dictator, because man does not live by bread alone. Now, your attention, please, for an interesting announcement. Now a little more about Lear radios and the new Lear tape recorder. This new method of recording captures sound on a magnetized tape. You snap a switch, and immediately you're taking down the songs of your children or the jolly antics of friends. Without a moment's delay, you can play it all back. For as Lear uses tape, it does not have to be rewound. What's more, anything you decide you do not want to keep is cleared off the tape simply by recording something else. Along with tape recording, Lear radios will bring you television, FM, short wave, and an entirely unique remote tuning control. You can select what features you want and a handsome cabinet that complements your home's decor. For there are many styles of Lear radios over a wide price range. Just as fast as we can, we are getting Lear radios into the hands of Lear dealers. We hope that the dealer near you will have them soon. For the one way to see and hear what these new instruments are contributing to home radios is to listen to them yourselves. When you do, we're sure you will agree that the finest radio investment you can make is in a radio made by Lear. L-E-A-R. Now back to Orson Welles, whose views and opinions are his own and do not necessarily represent those of Lear Incorporated. Dear Mr. Welles, why are returning veterans being taken for a ride in getting photostats of discharge papers? A simple absolute necessity is reaping a harvest for post-war profiteers. In all too many cases, veterans are paying $2 and more for a job that can be done at a reasonable profit for 50 cents. How about it? Sincerely, Florence Monte. Well, vets are being exploited in all kinds of ways. This is by no means the worst, but it's worth airtime to expose this racket, and Miss Monty gets a 5-tube Lear radio for bringing it to our attention. Merchants, associations, and chambers of commerce, please note. Representative Ellsworth B. Buck of New York's called attention to the fact that there's still one commodity in the country which there's no shortage. Government red tape. According to the congressman, there's so much of it around that a war veteran needing a government loan gets enmeshed in it even before he starts looking for non-existent homes or clothes or business opportunities. I hold in my hand, he asserted the other day in Congress, 17 feet of six complicated involved forms requiring some 360 answers and computations. To supply these answers and computations, the veteran would apparently need a tax lawyer, a real estate lawyer, an ex-Washington bureaucrat, and a certified public accountant. A veteran who could afford to pay such a staff would have no need for the loan. Well, it's time to say goodbye now. Please let me come to call again, and thanks for this time. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Lear Radio, I remain, as always, obediently yours. Listen again next Sunday over this same station for Orson Welles, presented by Lear Incorporated. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. I'm here with my friend Terry Phillips, 
who is uh, has his podcast and show Imagine Air Theater that you can catch imagine-air-theater.com. Go there, check out his shows. He's he's up to five, six now. I don't know. Six. 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 Not the six one. Six. Awesome. And uh, just some great variety there to listen to. Great shows. And it's not a huge time commitment on your part. Each episode, you know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Uh, does that sound about right, Terry? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, Kathy. Let alone that it takes so many hours to make them for the fact that it's well yeah <laughs> well, what's cool is he makes them in 20 minutes so it's just uh, from the writing him to the whole thing that it, it has to take on five more minutes to get him written in things so it's, it's 20 minutes base base eight i think <laughs> that's essentially with, with with my podcast that's what i do <laughs> it's, like, it's like okay just listen to it and talk about it and move on uh <laughs> It's all good. But Kathy, um, and, and Kathy fuller Celia is here with us, and she has released a couple of Jack Benny books. She's got another one coming out in the spring. Uh, her Jack Benny books, one is uh, about the whole kind of history of, of Jack and done in a series of little kind of articles on it. It's a really cool book to read, and you can jump all around and read whatever parts you're interested in the most, which is really cool. Then she has I ripped out the pages that you're not interested. There you go. And then she also has uh, her uh, another book that she says she's edited, doesn't say she's written, which is kind of cool. And she she credits Jack and Harry Kahn as writing, which are the first twenty six or so episodes uh, of the Jack Benny show. Most of them have, that have been lost to time, I think, except for one. And so you can't hear these things, but you can read them. And if you're a Jack Benny fan, like I am. You, when you read them, you can hear the voices in your head anyway. So um, my problem is I hear Jack's voice in my head like way too often. It's it's becoming an <laughs> 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 I got to go see a doctor about that. Anyway, yeah. But today, though, we're focusing on Orson Welles. And uh, Orson, I hear in my head, too, sometimes. And gosh, I love Orson. And and these, these shows have just been fantastic. And having you folks inside of these shows is wonderful. This one is one. It covers a whole bunch of ground, and so uh, let's let's get into it. Uh, we'll start uh, with with Terry. What are some of the things that you kind of uh, stuck out to you in this episode? Well, I'm going to give a, a broad sweep. I'll try to move through this quickly. First of all, this episode uh, was broadcast on February 24th, 1946, which had meaning for me because it was my dad's 25th birthday. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah, it um, starts out by talking about the weather. So I looked uh, through the New York Times and found that it was cold that day. He mentioned that that was uh, true, bone chilling. Uh, the low was 32 and uh, the high was 30. Wow. I've lost everybody. Hello. Is anybody still there? Hello, Terry. Do you hear me? Start over. Yeah, hang we on. hear you. Let's see, okay, now I hear you. It's like all of a sudden okay. everything froze. Uh, let's uh, let's go back to. I'll cut okay. it. I'm going to well, pick up where you, I left off. Just start from the beginning. Start from the beginning. For you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, this episode had special meaning for me because it was recorded on February 24th, 1946, which was my dad's 25th birthday. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, he uh, begins by talking about how cold it was in New York City that day. And I looked through the old New York Times and found that, in fact, it was cold that day. The low was 32 degrees and the high was 37. So it was, it was quite chilly, not exceptional for New York City in right. uh, February, but it was cold. And so it was so cold, he said, that he left his apartment and went to Ruben's Deli. Uh, sadly, is no longer around, but at the time it was a hotbed of, uh, Harry, of activity. You've got to learn how to do that. When you said it was so cold, you should have waited for me to say, how, how cold, cold was it? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> but then your follow-up uh, wouldn't be so much, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll try to get that better the next time. <laughs> He met, uh, Rubens um, did this thing where they would name sandwiches after celebrities. And he mentioned Carol Bruce, who was a famous band singer at the time. She had her own sandwich, the great Sophie Tucker. Um, he mentioned a sandwich named after Colonel J.C. Flippin. And, and J. Flippin was a 
a great character actor. Okay. Tyrone Power had his own sandwich. He did not mention sandwiches named after Al Jolson, Frank Sinatra, Judy Car uh, Garland, uh, Rudy Valley, Ed Sullivan, and perhaps of most interest to us, there was a Jack Benny, Mary Livingston sandwich. Oh, wow. Which was tongue only... turkey. Sorry? No, I can only, what was in that sandwich? Well, okay, so it was tongue, turkey, Swiss cheese, coleslaw, and Russian dressing on rye bread. Why it was named after them, I don't know. I think he just wanted to honor them with a sandwich. Yeah. Tongue for Mary and her sharp tongue, <laughs> turkeys for the turkeys that tried to try and kill Jack Benny for murder. Baby. And rye for his sandwich. representing the toupee. There you go. There you go. Kathy's got uh, all here. He, um, <laughs> He refers to uh, visiting uh, Alec Walcott, which was Alexander Walcott, and uh, uh, Dottie Parker, who was, of course, Dorothy Parker, and they were playing backgammon when he went, went to Game visit dropper. Toscanini uh. on the gramophone. Um, and he gives a vivid description of looking out the window of um, Walcott's apartment and seeing the East River ferry boat crossing um, the East River. Yeah. And there was a term he used, which I, I should have known. I had to look it up. Uh, it slipped a hawser. That's a hawser is a kind of uh, a mooring cable uh, that holds uh, a ship um, yeah. in, uh, in, uh, in the pier. Yeah. Um, and he also mentioned Welfare Island, which was originally called Blackwell Island and later in 1973 was renamed Roosevelt Island, of course, after uh -huh, the president. Okay. And uh, actually, I'm not sure which president, but it was any, anyway named after Roosevelt. And he said that it was a sad journey because uh, when you would go there uh, to Roosevelt Island or, or um, Welfare Island Welfare at the time, Island. you would see prisons, yeah. which were, you know, psychiatric prisons and, uh, yeah. and, and others. Um, and then he spends the rest of the episode talking about politics. Um, of course, he, he gives his uh, take on uh, the atomic bomb, which he goes into in greater detail in a subsequent episode. But he spends most of the second half of this uh, commentary talking about Argentina and Juan yeah. Perón. And uh, he uses a lovely turn of phrase. I mean, Orson Welles, what a great writer he was. I know. Um, he called Perón the sawdust Caesar of the pompous. What a great turn of phrase, right? <laughs> uh, and I learned a new Spanish word. He refers to the supporters, the rich landowners who supported Perón. They were um, uh, estancieros. Okay. That means rancher in Spanish, ranchers. How long uh, so was he, he, he covered? Charge sorry? How, long, how long was, do we know when, when he left office or when he lost power when Perón was ousted it was in the in the 50s i think and, yeah that's what i thought um yeah so and, he was um, in charge for at least five ten years or something probably yeah 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 um orson wells did not pull any punches on dictatorship of course he was always a champion of uh, of freedom yes and uh it was it was really great to hear him go full out on uh how horrible it was for the people of Argentina and that they needed help to stand up to these dictatorships. And it took a while before they got any help at all. Yes. And a lot of that was, uh, was um, surreptitious rather than, than open. Right. And, 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 you know, Wells connected the dots between the Nazis who had fled yes. Germany after the war and were protected because of course, Argentina was a supporter of Hitler Right. And uh, gave them to worry. He, he um, did not pull any punches on any of this stuff. It was a really terrific, powerful, uh, right. and, 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 and of course, entertaining uh, commentary. Yeah. He gets a lot into 15 minutes. The man talked yeah. really fast. Well, he, and clear. Yeah. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, listen, some, some folks talk fast and you're like, okay, what did they say? And, and you can't quite, you know, you start to lose. But his, and you're not used to someone with his vocal register speaking fast. I mean, he's low. So you're not, it just seems like low people are usually slow people. And, and when you talk fast, it's usually, you know, and, but with him, it's, it's low and fast and he does a great job of it and still uh, enunciates everything clearly and, and so forth. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Yep. His, his theatrical training. Yeah, I really right. think for just a normal person presenting this, 
if you were to if if you, if I was to if I was to take the script and I was to read it right and do it comfortably for me, I bet it'd be a half hour to forty minutes that I'd be talking and, and presenting the same amount of material he presents in fifteen, which could is be, could be. It's, it's almost like that's he wanted that longer period. You know what I mean? So yes. <laughs> I, I bet he's feeling very much the constraints of the fifteen minutes minus the you know i mean because he only had, that's fewer minutes because of the commercials and he has so much to say and that's a very good point daryl and terry you all are making yeah. about his, the intensity of everything he wants to talk about well mm -hmm. and and at the end not every time but a lot of the times he sounds kind of semi-annoyed like oh i'm thankful <laughs> for this time but it, it, i'm seeing i've got to go or whatever yeah. and so it's just kind of like more i wanted to say but you know that sort of is is the feeling you get uh it would be i would love to see like i say the scripts for these and see if each week there's another you know 25 percent that he doesn't get to that he kind of just shuts down but it doesn't seem like that in that his arc that he follows in his discussion always seems to be ending. It doesn't seem like, like, oh, he wasn't quite through something. It seems like he usually makes it. Um, and who knows? I mean, he could, I suppose, record this a couple times until he gets, until it fits in. Uh, we don't know if there's, you know, outtakes of this. Is it, because is this live or is it, I don't know. I'd say he, he says a number of times it's recorded or something, I think. Yeah. Yeah, which was also weird at that time. In 46, not a lot of people were doing recorded One things. Of the first, right? Yeah. But he'll oh, say he's recording and, in this hotel room or that thing. I don't, doesn't sound like it's supposed to be live. But And was it on the same day every week? Because this is February 24th, but the next one is March 3rd. So that can't be seven days later. Some, no. Something it, about in the, the, that spring. Oh, pardon you know, me, where he only had 28 days. Yes, no, that was seven days. Oh, okay, okay, there you go, there you okay. go. There you go. Math. Uh, and the thing is, honestly, right now you can't judge too much with the episodes because I've been hopping around and I mean, I'm going to get us back in line to where they need to be. But like, there's been some episodes that I listened to because I, I couldn't have you guys all the time. So there's some episodes I listen to and I go, okay, I can just give a commentary on that. I don't need everybody with that one because he sticks to one subject or something. There's an interesting one that, and this brings that up, that uh, I presented a couple weeks ago about comic books and where he's talking about comics and how someone sent him a, a letter that says they're contributing to delinquency of youth and that sort of thing, which I found interesting because I know quite a bit about comic books and, and was a huge fan in my younger days and still think it's interesting. But in 46, comics were pretty clean. They were, they were not, as far as I can, tell that was when they were just starting to leave the superhero thing and head into other directions now his prediction or you know like jack he's ahead of his time usually and just a year later or two years later 46 I mean, 47 48 49 50 that time frame that's where all the horror comics become huge ec comics takes off and so i mean there's just some horrendous stuff in there that i can see exactly why people were like okay this is horrible how would you you know um the most horrible one i can think of that i'll just throw out there for you just to show how bad comics got at one point um there's a horror story where you know and the guys did do the bad they did bad things these whoever the bad guy was did bad things but the way that they would kill them and do things. And there's one that's a, a, there's a member of the baseball team that I think was having affairs with a number of the different uh, players' wives and killed a player or something. Anyway, so it's his team takes the guy apart, takes like his intestines, runs them out along the baselines, has the bases be body parts, like his stomach is first base and his, his liver is, is oh, second Lord. base. And then they play a game on top of the guy's entrails. And, uh, and I mean, I'm going, okay, what other medium do I think would ever do this? All I can think of is like some writing. There's writings that are that dark that people have written over time, but usually they never convert them into, you know, television shows or 
a movie you just don't get that and so seeing that in a comic book is just like oh my gosh and these are and generally the comics are sold to 10 year olds and things and so I'm like okay i can see these guys when and and what's hilarious is they brought the the um they had a senate um hearing on this and they yep. brought the the um main producer of these comics out there and they'd show him these comics and he'd be like uh, don't you see that this is uh you know horrible and 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 he says no i don't think so i mean the, the, the that shot you just showed that cover you have there of, of my comic um the woman's head yes it's cut off and the guy's holding her head but you notice that we have the bottom of the comic cut off right at her neck so we don't show the blood dripping off her neck and things so that would be horrendous but we don't we're not showing that on the cover so that's okay i don't know how he would explain the entrails and the baseball game but i'm sure he would find some way to say it could have been worse we did this thing instead but my gosh and and to hear orson talk about that but before all this happened and and certainly they put on a comics code and they made it impossible. To, I mean, essentially, it took that one guy's business, the, the founder of EC, um, Bill Gaines, and made it where his comics, I mean, his whole line, he, did, he couldn't do it. They, they said you couldn't feature the word crime in your title above this big of a font or something. And he had crime like on tons of his titles. You couldn't put horror, you couldn't put terror, you couldn't do any of that. Couldn't have any blood, you couldn't have any it got to the point where it was impossible for him to make the comics at all that he was making. Um, so it worked. I mean, it put him out of business and uh, the comics then from then on were even up to through Marvel and DC was where they, they had real trouble because they're like, okay, we can't show a zombie. We can't have a werewolf. We can't have, uh, there'd be all these things that were blocked. And so they slowly had to chip away at it and go, okay, if we use a zombie in this story in this way, can't we do that? I mean, it's just, and eventually now they kind of, I think they still might have the approved thing on there, but it's so weak and they, they've gained so much more power they can kind of do whatever they want, but they're realizing it benefits them to do something a little bit tasteful instead of <laughs> over the top. But, but yeah, it was just an interesting episode. I mean, did you guys know much about the comic book thing with your historical backgrounds and things or not so much K carrie uh, you know uh, archie and jughead yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, well i i did because um uh it was a big deal at the time but there's also another wonderful book called cycle of outrage uh -huh. um and and it, it with every sort of new popular media that uh, uh um has a, a can have a child audience. Everything from Nickelodeon theaters to radio shows to comic books to television to video games to rap music lyrics. There has been someone who says, save the children. And so with every new media that right. this happens, sort yeah. of like every 20 years, somebody has to go, oh, the children. And so, um, but I will say of all so, yeah. of the things that I've seen in all those other media, with maybe the exception of video games, I think can get pretty dark too sometimes. I've never seen anything go as dark as comics went <laughs> in, the, in the late 40s and early 50s. So so I can see the, the, the backlash. Um, they, they, I mean, they, they, not, were, they, had a, a, they also had a, a wide readership among um, older, yes. uh, uh, older children. Um, I understand the most popular things for sent to soldiers during world war ii were comic books yes the, the soldiers much preferred reading comic books to reading sort of actual literature so yes. they're you know it was a, a comic oh, yeah, scholar sure. could tell us a I whole lot about it was good. big business and so. that's what they were trying sure. to do i mean the horror comics and that sort of thing they they realized okay they weren't getting enough of a kid market anymore and they couldn't just build so they were trying to build another market and so their other market was specifically pretty much for the soldiers. I mean, that's why after World War II, comics change and become darker because they realized soldiers were, had been reading them uh, during World War II. And then hopefully we're gonna continue reading them when they got home. And then uh, with the Korean War happening and everything. So I, I can see how all this came yeah. about, but it's just interesting. And then you, then like you say, you get the 
parental backlash and things and yeah uh, interesting stuff anyway yeah so so we'll see if that cycles around again i'll 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 uh do that one or if i feel like doing a, if we have a week where we get ahead and things i might bring that one back just because it's interesting to, to chat about um anyway but yeah so I, I would fill in with for some of those episodes and things in the past but uh let's just let people enjoy this unless kathy do you have anything else to add about uh, this particular episode or it's all no, good? no no i think we talked about how compressed stream of consciousness but yeah. it's almost like he's he's on a little amphetamine kick here yeah. <laughs> but um but so um so incredibly well written and so emotional uh, uh everything from sad thinking about prisoners and um and those psychiatric hospitals to the atom bomb to yeah. reuben yeah. sandwiches do we do i assume that that reuben's deli came up it's, with a, the it's a controversy there was another reuben who uh takes uh, credit for <laughs> okay it takes for credit for the reuben okay. reuben's <laughs> deli was was reuben's deli Oh, and a footnote to uh, Juan Perón. I, I just had to check because I didn't trust my own memory. He did uh, serve two terms through the 50s, but then he came back a third time after some uh, interim governments and served for a year from 73 to 74 until he died in, in 74. Oh, great. Perón was, was in and out uh, for a long time. And uh, and, and, and his wife, Evita, and yeah, his uh, wife Evita, had a great course. deal to do of with course. it. And so. Isabel Perón. Um, yeah. but, but of course, Orson Welles, again, being having foresight, caught him and called him out early on, early long on. before anybody else. Yeah. Yep. yeah, interesting. Okay, well, well, we'll end this one. Enjoy the episode, everybody, and we'll see you next time. And next time, it's a little slower pace. One, I <laughs> so so, which is which which he does too. Orson tends to understand, I think, when he goes, okay, I probably put a little too much in this one, and the next week he kind of compensates, and and then he'll have weeks where he's got kind of slow ones. And you can see him kind of going, oh, I need to fit more in. And so then he he's gears up. You just never know. <laughs>